accidents, and about why a singularity won't leave leftover accidental margins. Um, and I realize that may sound strange, because we're used to being able to take accidents for granted. Plants appear in the cracks between buildings. Kids see and learn things you weren't planning for them to see or learn. Totalitarian regimes lose their hold. Evolution creates new species, one accidental death or mutation at a time. Aging kills us all, one bit of accidental damage at a time. Computers crash, traffic snarls, and human plans, for better or for worse, come crashing down. But even though accident has been with us forever, it seems to me that it's likely to end soon after the dawn of smarter than human intelligence. And I hope in the coming 20 minutes to convince you that that's so. I'll proceed as follows. First, I'll say a bit more about what I mean by accidents. Then I'll sketch very briefly the sorts of artificial intelligence futures I have in mind. I'll consider what abilities an AI engineer would have to have in order to avoid accidents. And I'll talk about why an accident-free future feels implausible, and whether our intuitions of implausibility are reliable. So, by accidents, I have in mind anything that exists for some reason other than that someone with power wanted that specific thing to exist. So the most obvious version of this are literal regions untouched by engineering, like canyons within a city. Uh, and engineers, ac accidents, accidental margins in the sense have been shrinking. So in prehistoric times, most of the world was left untouched by engineering. Cities have been expanding, or trying to expand them further. By accidents, I'll also include any case where the microstructure is intentioned. So this podium exists on purpose, it's in a particular shape, but the details of the podium, the details of the wood, the details of the wood on the stage, are just in an accidental configuration, stuff that happened to come out of the tree. And modern materials are messed with a little bit more, a little bit more care goes into it, but there's still a lot of happenstance, and one could imagine a future engineering that decides things on the atomic scale without that sort of leftover margin. Finally, and most abstractly, by accidents I'll include any traits that come bundled together in cases where you only want one of the traits in question. So right now, if you want beef, you have to grow a whole cow. And that cow includes things like the cow's knees, which are full of bones and cartilage that you probably didn't want, and its brains and ability to make choices and experience things. So it's a bit like ordering off one of those menus where you have everything from column A or everything from column B. You want a beef dish, you have to buy cow bones and cow experiences. But even within the realm of human engineering, we're learning how to make minor brain choices. So people are attempting to make in vitro meats, meats produced without any animals attached. Um, it's a real technology in the sense that they're able to make meat cells now within labs and are hoping for commercial production, although it's still some decades away. Uh, similarly, you used to have to choose between like an entire cow genome and an entire sheep genome. We're learning how to make finer grain choices. And so the realm of margins and accidents are shrinking even within the realm of human engineering. Uh, but what I want to describe is what happens when you get engineers that are smarter than humans, more powerful than humans, what happens in a world that doesn't leave any room for accidents or margins. Uh, and engineering on the scale is neither necessarily good nor necessarily bad. What it is is different, so different that it's hard to wrap our minds around. Whether it's good or bad will depend on who's doing the engineering. So, quick sketch about the future of artificial intelligence. Um, and because it had to be quick, I'm not giving all the evidence but I have some handouts by the door on the little table that have pointers to the literature. There is analysis behind this. There's a community of researchers that mostly agree about the points I'm going to cover. Although there's exceptions, it's not civil science. Uh, so first point 
If science keeps chugging long enough, if it's not interrupted by a nuclear war or something like that, eventual AI looks almost inevitable. And the reason is basically that there's progress on all sorts of fronts of the sorts that Anders was describing. Hardware, data, algorithms, neuroscience data. Um, and there's no reason to stop making progress. It's sort of like climbing a mountain. You take step after step after step. You don't know where the summit is, but you know you'll eventually get there. Second point, if we do get digital human level intelligence, we're likely to get intelligence that's much stronger than human shortly thereafter. And the reasoning behind this is a little bit complex, but the basic idea is that the diff on a scale of engineering difficulty, the differences between humans are almost negligible. So some humans are better than others at science, or at politics, and social navigation, but on the scale of different things our technologies could be able to engineer, these differences are very small. Also, while it may take a long time to make the first AI, once you have it, you can have an AI population explosion as the software is copied across the hardware base. Copying software is easy. Software doesn't have a fixed time scale, so your brain operates at a particular rate. It's stuck operating at that rate. It's made out of neurons. Software is copyable information that can run at different speeds on different machines. And finally, there's the idea Emily was talking about about an intelligence explosion and recursive self-improvement. So if AI is designed, it will be designed by a team of human engineers, a team with relatively fixed capacities. If the AI gets to the point where its abilities are comparable to those of the engineers, a point Nick Bostrom calls the crossover point, then the intelligence that's doing the engineering is itself improved by the engineering enabling a positive feedback loop. And so for all of these reasons, it seems plausible that once you hit human-level digital intelligence, you could see a speed-up, where further AI engineering happens on a faster time scale. And so just as biological evolution was helping lots of species, but human, it pulled lots of species in lots of different directions, but more than one was evolving toward intelligence. Still, humans got to technology first, and further biological evolution is sort of irrelevant at this point. Similarly, it's possible that the first AI could acquire permanent advantage. Finally, I'm talking about AI this and AI that, but there is no one thing AI. I'm talking about artificial intelligence just means talking about any intelligence that isn't human, which is sort of like saying foods that aren't, so artificial intelligence is sort of like saying foods that aren't pineapples. It's a large space, everything in the space except that little dot. So, that was a brief sketch of the sorts of AIs I'm concerned with. What, would these, what powers would these AIs need to have in order to avoid accidents? Uh, so to start off with, let's do an easier question. What would it take to avoid macro accidents, to avoid big destabilizing forces? Uh, so our ancestors were destabilized by all kinds of things. Big rainstorm, bad year for the food they were used to eating. Today, we, I mean, we complain about the weather, but we're insulated against quite a lot of these things. Surviving natural accidents isn't quite a bar that humans are past, but we're pretty close. More tricky, maybe, is surviving the sorts of forces that we can unleash. So knowing what we know, knowing what we don't know, knowing how not to send worse things our way than nature can. But a lot of the difficulty is sort of human-specific overconfidence, specific psychological mechanisms in humans that don't need to be in the space of all possible minds. And in fact, the mathematics required to correctly estimate one's own knowledge seems not to be very difficult. Uh, so suppose you do have an AI that has those two abilities. Suppose you have an AI that's big enough to weather storms and whatever nature throws at it, and it also knows the limits of its own knowledge, doesn't unleash forces beyond its own control. What follows from that? So first of all, it seems unlikely that you'd see big resources like this sitting untouched. Anything with goals will gobble up resources in pursuit of its goals. Um, and things we don't think of as resources, this is an image from Back to the Future where they like, Remodernize the car and make it eat garbage. The better your technology, the larger a class of things you're able to put to use. Second of all, 
that would be able to avoid accidental evolution. So biological species, current biological species, if you make a mutation error, you get a viable organism some of the time. But it's not hard to design error-detecting codes. Codes where unless you get, pick your favorite number, 300 simultaneous mutations all happening at once, the code does some bit sums, checks the relationship of the numbers to the other numbers, and figures out that there was a mutation. So it's not hard to design things so that all of the self-replicating smart entities can't accidentally evolve. Third, no need for accidental death. We die because the information in our minds, the information that makes you you, accidentally decays. With proper use of backups and redundancy, there's no need for that. Fourth, perhaps more disturbingly, no need for accidental legacy code. So a lot of, just as one can make beefsteaks without cows, so also if there was something you needed humans for, like job skills or our usefulness as pets or something like this, you could sever whatever that use case was from all of the other features we might care about. So the bundles of Earth's libraries, the genomes, the cultures, the individuals, are bundles, they're columns. You don't have to separately have them once you have the ability to engineer on this scale. Um, still some limits to engineering. Uh, so there's some need for experiment, although it's easy to overestimate this. I mean, so physicists were able to predict the Trinity test before they did it. They were able to predict this because they were tapping into the deep nature of physics. Um, and the theoretical limits on how far one can tap in are very high, but not all the way. Also, some resource bound still. And if there is more than one AI making it to superintelligence, it could still have conflict. Nevertheless, if you had only one AI, the sort of power we're talking about is the sort of power which could be used to lock in a single set of goals basically forever. These could be goals we want or goals we don't want. So, why, do this, why does the idea of a world where goals are locked in basically forever feel implausible? And are those intuitions reliable? Uh, so one reason why it feels implausible is simply that that's not the world we're used to. We're used to a world in which accidents permeate everything. But it's hard actually to imagine a world in which what we're used to can stay the same. It's sort of like if you saw somebody halfway through a backflip and you're like, wait, stay right there. A lot of the forces that keep our world in its present configuration are forces of change. So if we keep the same amount of technological progress, we go off on a different level of technology than if we keep the same level of technology. There's no point that's on both of those dotted lines. The economy stays stable because it's growing. The economy's growing because technology is changing. It's hard to know what a world in 300 years that had stayed the same could mean, or whether it could be coherent, even if you add in small changes like flying cars. A second reason why this strikes people as implausible is because it trips intuitions of hubris. We're afraid to reach for too much, or even to imagine scenarios of reaching for too much, lest we be struck down. Still, we did eventually fly. Artificial intelligence is scary. We seem to be in the position of a sorcerer's apprentice a position of working to unleash forces that we don't yet understand, don't yet know understand how to control. If the hubris intuitions cause people to think really hard and take appropriate safety precautions, I'm all in favor of hubris intuitions. But if the hubris intuitions instead cause people to turn away from these sorts of futures and not to consider them, not to consider the sorts of futures that we might deliberately or unwittingly unleash, well, that doesn't sound like a good idea. Humanity is doing research near dangerous tech, near unknown technologies with potentially dangerous implications. But what's at stake, especially the possibility of locking in a set of goals for all eternity, and given that even if AI could get to a level of being accident-free, we are certainly not there, it would be good to get our eyes open however we can. Thanks.